Hello and welcome to Let Me Bore Your Smoke In Away. Or for want of a better title, <laughs> Let Me Bore Your Smoking Away. Does that make sense as a title? I don't know. Anyway, this is uh, kind of an updated updated uh, version of what I've already been doing with my Stop Smoking Hypnosis recordings. So, I, uh, I only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes, because it's going to be boring and you might you might fall asleep okay i'll be i'll be honest you might actually your your mind may drift off somewhere more interesting like dreamland so what is this exactly what is this thing that i'm doing here well this is a, a very chatty version of uh, the previous things I've done. So I've actually, this isn't the only boring podcast I do. I do Let Me Boy to Sleep. So that's for people with insomnia, uh, sleep issues, or they just want to relax, you know. Uh, I've got the Let Me... Uh, ASMR Whisper, Let Me Bore You to Sleep. So it's the same podcast, really. It's a, it's just me whispering instead of talking. Uh, the third one is Let Me Bore Your Pain Away. So that's for chronic pain relief. Uh, I do have another one, Let Me Bore Your Stress Away. And this is Let Me Bore Your Smoking Away. So the idea behind it is... I just talk. Here's, here's, here's the deal, actually. Here's the deal. I talk. And if you, if, you know, only listen if you find benefit from listening. Okay. Only listen if you find benefit. So, if you feel better, if you feel more positive, if you feel uh, more focused on stopping or staying stopped from smoking, then this recording has worked. So this recording is for both people who want to stop smoking and who have already stopped smoking. It's, you could say like it's ongoing support for those that have already stopped. Uh, and also an opportunity with every recording to stop, to say, you know what? That's it. No more. Or as Duran, the boxer famously said, no more. Although he said, you know, he said no mass, but that means no more in Mexican or Venezuelan or wherever he's from. So saying no more is something to, I'd say probably quite useful to remember. To say that for other things, you know, for various things, not just for in, inhaling toxic smoke into your lungs, um, for pleasure, <laughs> um, but a lot of things, whether it's being around uh, individuals that you really know are harmful, you know to you emotionally psychically 
maybe physically even. Uh, maybe I need to do a podcast, let me bore your abuser away. Aimed at people that are being, you know, hurt. Who continuously put up with it. Because some people put up with that shit for years and years, decades even. When they need to get out. So maybe I could bore people into that. I don't know. It'd be nice. It's a nice idea, isn't it? Nice idea. So this is very chatty. This is very, it will seem very unfocused. Now, if you really want to listen to an unfocused recording, listen to the Let Me Bore You to Sleep. That is the most unfocused recording I will ever, you'll ever hear me do anyway. This is focused in a sense of it's about stopping smoking, but it's also, or staying stopped, but it's also, you know, eliminating cigarettes from your life, etc. It's also about getting in touch with the positivity or increasing the positivity within yourself, moving forward in life. Valuing yourself. Because I, I know when I was younger, most things, most things happened when I was younger. Uh, oh, everything. So when I was younger, I, I don't think I put much value on my life. I used to smoke. Uh, I used to take drugs, drink, whatever. And I genuinely didn't care. And I don't think many people do when they're very young. You know, late teens, twenties, uh, early twenties. I mean, the hope is that by the time someone gets to sort of 25, they'll start turning into an adult. But it didn't happen with me. I became a semi-adult when I was in my early 30s. And I'm still waiting to become a full adult, I think. It's it's a very, very slow process for me. Because I'm pretty, I'm quite immature. And I realised that some of the things that I've done over the years... Very childish. It's a very childish thing. It's like people that spend all their time taking drugs or drinking. It's a, it's kind of a child's life. It's how a child would live if they could just do whatever they wanted to do, play with their toys, eat all the chocolate, drink all the the pop, the fizzy drinks. Uh, eat all the ice cream and just basically do whatever they wanted to do whenever they wanted to do it without any comeback and expect instant gratification and will not be told no. So that's, that's a drug addict, you know, and cigarettes are a drug. It's a very different type of drug though. I think for me, Cigarettes were the hardest not to stop taking, like, completely, but sometimes the hardest to be without. So if I used to run out, it was a big deal. It's like, no, I'd do anything but run out. I'm like, no, I'm not going to run out. The shop finishes, closes at 10. I'm going to make sure i got them. They become almost embedded uh 
it was almost like they were as important as milk. Milk and butter and bread. You know, the very, very basics. Um, you know, when you go through life and maybe you're going through a difficult time and you've got no money for food, really, to buy much food, but you have the basics. You have your breakfast cereal, maybe cornflakes, your milk, your bread so you can have toast and then your margarine or butter to put on the toast. All very, very cheap stuff that isn't, you know, perhaps a very healthy diet, but it's essential. Well, cigarettes kind of became that with me. An essential. Wasn't a luxury. Wasn't a treat. Was it something I look forward to doing? You know, it's like, oh, I'll go to the shops and I get that and I'll be, oh, I'll have a lovely cigarette tonight. You know, when I finish work, I'll, I'll, you know, have a, have a can of lager and I'll have a nice, a nice cigarette as a treat. No. I mean, some people can do that. I know. I know one person that can do that. They don't smoke. Uh, haven't smoked for years, but whenever they visit certain people that smoke, they smoke. Buy a packet of cigarettes and that's it. The rest of the time there, they don't. I'm not one of those people. I know that. I tried it and it didn't work. I stopped smoking for 17 years and uh, I was around someone that was smoking and I thought, and the thing is, people do offer, like, oh, do you want a cigarette? No, I, I told you I don't smoke. Haven't smoked for 17 years. Oh, okay, do you want a cigarette though? No, I just told you, in the end, it was like, okay, I'll have one. I just have one. And then like, oh yeah, I can go. I can have one and that's it. And then eventually, oh, I'm knocking everything. Eventually, you know, started again. So think about stopping and staying stopped is to not make it a big deal. It is a, it is kind of a big deal, but to make it so it isn't, so it's not a big deal. To make it so it's, it's the most natural thing in the world, which it is. Let's face it, not sucking on a, a lit stick of tobacco, uh, is natural not to do that. I mean, it's nothing particularly weird to do it if, cause we can't pretend it feels weird if we well can, but if you've been doing it for years, it's like natural, isn't it? It feels natural, but it's also natural to not do it. And there are millions, probably billions of people on the planet that do not smoke. And they get on okay. They get on fine. I mean, if you look at the Olympic Games, how many of those athletes do you think smoke? Now, you might say, of course, none of them. No, there will be some. There will be some smokers that eat out of the Olympic Games. They, they're they probably not the the uh, runners, <laughs> to be fair. But some of them will smoke. They might not smoke all the time, but they might have the, the crafty one every now and then. But generally, it's going to be a fairly smoke-free situation. And they seem fine. They seem to function okay. I mean, now, in prison, people, they can't smoke. I think they were allowed vapes. But they can't smoke cigarettes anymore. And if they're smuggled in, they cost a fortune. I mean, it's £20 for 10, no, for £20 for 20 
cigarettes now or 22 pound in the UK in prison it's like a hundred pound or something plus they smell bad because they've been up someone's bum hole so you <laughs> it's like do I want to smoke but do I want to smoke that bad do I want that aren't this cigarette supposed to be white nope it's been up my ass oh, that's why it's okay lovely mm, can't wait for it to dry out so I can smoke it and inhale that into me lungs. It's weird, isn't it? You think about it. The inhaling something toxic. Like, on purpose. On purpose. Like, choosing to do that. Like, if you was in a house fire... Or there was a fire and you, you know, and you choking. You kind of want that to stop. Yet we, the idea of choosing to do that. I mean, I was my, uh, a while back, the alarm smoke alarm went off in one of my uh, neighbor's flats so I went down and left the food I don't know what it was The one of the electrical cooking appliances was left on and the place was full of smoke like really really bad um, and I got in there and I opened the windows and everything but it I was coughing and it's, and it's just smoke just smoke, which is what people inhale when they smoke. It's like, oh, is that what they call it, smoking? Oh, okay. But it's like, this doesn't feel so nice. Surely I should just go in there with a straw and just sit there and enjoy it. Mm, it's free smoke. I haven't had to pay for this. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, I, I, definitely, this is brilliant, especially after breakfast. Oh, but it didn't feel that way. It felt like I was choking. And I guess we all know what it feels like to choke, don't we? Like temporarily for a short period of time. You know, when you eat and it goes down a wrong hole or whatever, um, or you drink and it goes down like into your lungs or I don't know, just like, uh, and you, you're kind of coughing for a bit. We've all had that feeling, but it's, it's almost like, oh, I love that feeling. I want to have more of that when I get older. How can I have more of that feeling when I'm older? I don't know, I'll smoke. You know, I've got a friend who's got COPD. And asthma. And I heard some weird noises the other day. This was two weeks ago. And I, I was worried for my friend's safety, like health-wise. So I go downstairs and I see his dog in the garden, so I went out go into the garden, and my friend was in the garden, awake. The noises he was making was just him being awake, breathing. And it was, oh, like, I can't even do it, because it'll make me cough if I try and mimic it. But the sound was awful. Really, really kind of scary. Um, and I'm just like, oh, I really, really hope I never get like that in my life, you know? It's, I mean, my granddad had, uh, asbestosis. So he didn't smoke. He, he he tried a pipe, I think, when he was in his 30s. But because he had about 500 children, he couldn't afford to smoke. 
didn't have enough money to smoke. So he tried it, but then it wasn't that bothered, so he didn't bother anymore. But because he breathed in the asbestos from where he worked, he, um, yeah, he basically was lung cancer and he, he died. Even his breathing didn't sound as bad as my friend's. And it was like, wow. And the thing is, when it's someone like that, I've, I had a friend as well. She had lung cancer and she died. And you just want to take it away from them, don't you? You want to just like, what can I do? You know, what, can, how can I help? And you can't, you can't help them. The only thing you can do is help yourself, I guess. Now, I don't want these recordings to be talking about lung conditions and stuff. I really don't. Because it just, it's just not really what I want to talk about. I mean, it can be, uh, for some people, it can be the, the difference between carrying on smoking and saying nah thank you no more to that actually i think i'm gonna start to appreciate being able to breathe i'll start using my lungs for what they're meant for i'm just going to take a break and just use my lungs for breathing as an experiment as a little experiment, I'm going to just use my lungs for breathing, just for a little while, okay? Might sound weird, but I'm just going to give it a go. Just for, a, I don't know, just for a few years. Let's just see how it goes. And see whether or not I feel different. Because that's what I said about this recording. Even though, on some level, you might be listening thinking, what is this bloke talking about? He's just talking a bunch of crap. How is this in any way, how can it be useful in any way for me to stop smoking or to stay stop smoking, to stay motivated to... uh continue as a non-smoker for the rest of my life and actually decide that you're never going to go back you know that you've made your decision you already made your decision before you decided to listen to me and there's personal reasons behind it i know we don't want to talk about illness and stuff but let's face it we all think about it if you don't, you're bullshitting. If you're saying you don't, you, you're lying. We all do. We all, we all, it's something we're all scared of. I know I am. And sometimes, I mean, you don't have to acknowledge that you're scared of something. There's no, there's nothing wrong with being scared of stuff. I'm scared of stuff. But then there's stuff I'm not scared of. You know, I'm not scared of everything. I think that's, that's what they call being a human. <laughs> you know? I mean, being scared of getting terminally ill and dying is, that's kind of a natural thing. I don't think there's anything weird about that at all. You know, I'm, I'm not one these that like, Oh yes, just bring it on, I'll be fine. No, I don't want it. Keep it away from me. So if you kind of like me a bit and you don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to get ill and you don't want that stuff, then yeah, stopping and being a non-smoker is the obvious route to take, the obvious path to wobble down
the choice. The choice is yours. The choice sounds dramatic. The choice is yours. And it is true. But remember that choice is every second of every day. You choose what you do next. No one's in control of you. Not really. I know, you know, there are situations where people are being controlling and, you know, if you're in prison, you know, you're, there's, you know, there's a lot of control involved in that situation. Um, but I mean, in a general life, uh, we get to choose what we do next. Might not seem like a choice. You know, if your boss is telling you, do that. And you don't want to do that, whatever it is. You choose to do it, even though you think you're not choosing because you have to, because your boss said so. And no, you're choosing to do it. Now, if you, you're choosing knowing that if you went against what your boss is saying, then there's going to be consequences as there are consequences if you do what your boss says. There's consequences, whatever happens, whatever we choose to do, there are consequences. And the idea of those consequences, like it sounds very negative, it's not, it's just, you know, everything follows a thing, you know? It's one thing leads to another. It's just, I don't know why my voice is going high, one thing leads to another. And it just can, life is like that, isn't it? It continues. What happens in five seconds, it will be dependent upon what happens in the five seconds previous to that five seconds. And a lot of that has to do with choices. You know, if you, you don't get drunk unless you drink alcohol. You have to drink a certain amount of alcohol. It varies for different people. But you can't get drunk without drinking alcohol. You know, it's it's something that you need to do to get to that position, at that point. So being drunk is the consequence of drinking alcohol. It's not a punishment, it's just a consequence. It's the result. So if I drink out of that bottle of water here, now chances are, because there's a very thin plastic bottle, it will start crinkling. It will start, I don't know if you can hear this. Yeah? It's going to make that noise when I drink. I've decided to drink. But now, because I've moved it and crinkled it a bit, it may, sporadically, every now and then, make some crinkly noises. Happens more with the bigger bottles, but sometimes happens with the small ones as well. But knowing that, I've made that choice. But in the same way, I'm sitting in there, I think the radio is maybe on, and I'm talking. So I need to have drinks. I need to have a drink of water. Because my, my mouth, you know, my, my voice gets, uh, might get a little bit croaky or my mouth gets, a, my throat gets a bit dry maybe. So I need to drink water when I'm, when I'm talking. I noticed that Sometimes, and it's weird that just a, a glass or a mouthful of water can actually ease cravings. And I think maybe that's, maybe that's because perhaps We confuse physical sensations, ones that are not connected to craving, with craving. 
So maybe the, the, the sensation of needing water and a dry throat and needing something connects to the needing or feeling that perhaps we need something else when actually we don't. We just need the water. And then when you feel your throat nice and damp, wet from the water and you've had a drink and everything feels much nicer and fresher. And then you take a breath. And it's only when you breathe that you realize what you need your lung, your lungs for. I mean, without, you can't overplay, as I say, you can't overplay the important of your, the importance of your lungs. Oh, he's going to lecture us about lungs now. No, I'm not. I'm really not. Uh, I'm kind of reminding myself to be fair. They're just so important. And what I noticed is when I stopped smoking, I've stopped a few times over the years, but the most recent time I noticed that within a short while and not, not it didn't take long, my lung capacity seemed to increase so I could take a breath and it was maybe uh, maybe one fourth more than it was before it's hard to judge it really now my lung capacity is being fine I don't have COPD I don't have asthma I did get tested for asthma a few years ago when I was coughing, but that was not asthma. That was put down to stress, can you believe? I'd say a few years. This was back in 2013, I think. 2014, 2013. So that's nine years ago, blimey. Anyway. As we get older... Our lung capacity reduces a bit. It's just an age thing. It's nothing, I mean, you know, it's nothing we can do about it, really. It's just, I mean, I guess it happens less in people that are super fit. But it's natural. It's just a natural thing that happens with age. Uh, just like I now look very much like George Clooney because I've become super handsome as I got older it's it's just one of those weird things that just happens yeah I wish so when people smoke when they're younger their lung capacity is large anyway because they're young so they don't notice it so much and when they stop smoking they might notice it but they might not because their lung capacity is large anyway but when you're older middle aged maybe maybe in 30s even late 20s 50s it doesn't matter when what age you are you can really notice the difference after stopping. Now, you may be listening to this and agree with me on that one. And I think it's worth remembering as well. I mean, it might just be me, but I don't think it is. Is breathing through your mouth, you can get more oxygen than breathing through your nose. Now, I know it's for me, that's an obvious thing. Unless you've got, uh, unless you've got caves for nostrils, you know, unless you've got the biggest, massivest nostrils in the world. Uh, I've got the biggest nose in the world, but my nostrils aren't that big. You're still not going to breathe in as much as you will do from your mouth. 
It just is more coming in. Now, a way to reduce anxiety is to stop breathing through your mouth and only breathe through your nose for a while because that does the equivalent of breathing into a bag. You know, people that hyperventilate due to stress, anxiety, uh, tension. So breathing through your nose slowly is the equivalent of breathing into one of those bags because there's a limit to how much you can breathe in when you breathe through your nose. Unlike when you breathe through your mouth, it's almost like you can breathe so much more in, uh, quicker. It might be the same amount, but slower for your nose. But with your mouth, it's just all in once. So when you're trying to calm down, or uh, one thing is when you wish to slow down your thoughts and your mind, especially in those moments when maybe you were thinking of going backwards, taking a backwards step, instead of moving forward, towards the kind of healthy, happy future that you really do want for yourself. You could breathe through your nose, close your mouth, breathe through your nose slowly. In and then out. And you could breathe through your nose, and even if you feel like you're not getting the amount of oxygen that you want like you would do if you're breathing through your mouth just accept the amount you're getting because you know you're okay you know it's only a problem if no oxygen is coming in or no oxygen is leaving it's leaving or whatever the different compounds of that air is but you know what I mean the air's going in the air's going out Because it's very hard to breathe really quickly through your nose. In fact, it, it takes a bit of, it would take a bit of practice to actually learn to do it. So we don't naturally do that. But we do sometimes in the event of, uh, problematic situation or thinking negatively, anxiously, over breathe, breathing too much, which then floods the blood system, the bloodstream, the brain, it was just too much happening. Too much stimulation, which is why when you close your mouth, you just breathe through your nose for a bit. It allows you to remember what your decision is remember that living your life as a non-smoker is what you've decided and even if listening to these recordings every now and then just as a little top up to remind yourself why you've decided to Live your life. In fact, you could say you decided life. Decided to choose life. I know it's an old slogan. But it's it's very valid, really. Or you've decided to choose breath. Decided to choose breathing. And also, in a way, and I just thought about this, it's not very fair on your lungs, is it, to to be smoking anyway? Because your lungs don't have a say. If you actually asked your lungs directly, 
What do you think their answer would be? Because that would be the equivalent of uh, f- asking your knee, your right or left knee, uh, is it okay if I hit you with a hammer really hard? Or to say to your toes, is it okay if I take my shoes off and kick a brick wall with my bare feet, with my toes? Is, is it all right if I do that? Are you okay with that? Well, they're going to say, no, no, what do you, what do you mean if I'm okay with like, that? Are you crazy? Of course I'm not okay with that. Put your socks on, put your shoes on and go back inside. What on earth are you on about? Is it okay? No, it's not okay. What's wrong with you? When would it ever be okay to hit your knee with a hammer? It's not okay. You're, you're not, you think your knee's gonna say, yeah man, that's fine, yeah, go ahead. Should be, should be a laugh. No. Your knee's gonna say no. And if you attempt that, I'm gonna hit you in the head. I'm gonna knee you in, in the face. You ain't hitting me with a hammer. So, I'm pretty sure, pretty, pretty, pretty sure, that if you was to actually ask your lungs, what they think about the idea of you smoking. So I thought it'd be quite nice if we did that now. So if your eyes aren't closed, close your eyes. And just imagine you're in a room, you're talking to your lungs. And just ask your lungs. And you could just base it, uh, how do you feel about me smoking? And just notice your lungs, focus on your lungs and just get an idea of what they would say to you. Maybe you can hear it. Or you could just basically say to your lungs, do you want me to smoke? Yes or no? It's weird when I did that, my lungs started filling up with air. I was like, <sighs> almost um, just to enjoy doing it. Just to enjoy the ability to be pretty much at full capacity for my age. I don't know what full capacity would be. If I was 20, but it feels fairly full. What do your lungs say to you? Because basically, if you think about it, it's like hanging your lungs up. And then use them as punch bags every day. You know, is that okay if I use you as a punch bag? Ask your lungs that. Is that okay if I use you as a punch bag? What do you think they're going to say? No. You can't use me as a punch bag. What kind of... What are you on about? Leave me alone. That's the thing, smokers, they're forcing their lungs to inhale that stuff. They're not getting permission. They're not asking permission to do that. They're just doing it, going ahead. Completely uh, oblivious, actually, to the fact that they haven't asked permission. They haven't considered how their lungs feel. 
this part that's well, it's among the most important part of our entire body, without which we die. You know, we can't we can't live without a heart. We can't live without lungs. We can live on a ventilator in a machine. You know, on a machine in a hospital for a period of time, I guess. But you know, outside of that situation. I guess what I'm saying is lungs are pretty important. A bit more important than toenails, that's that's all. Yeah, if you said to your fingers, I'd like to pull my fingernails out, is that okay? No, it's not okay, leave me alone. I don't want you pulling my fingernails out. Yeah, pulling the fingernails out is nothing compared to smoking. It's going to cause a bit of damage, it's going to be painful. But long-term damage, not nothing. It's weird, isn't it? It's almost like the, because the pain comes later, like it doesn't matter. But if someone said to you, you know, here's, here's the like, the most delicious food or dessert you'll ever taste in your life. So you, you might like ice cream or you might like burgers or you might, there's something that you like. You might like curry. And they said here, and they presented this to you and said, this is the best you will ever taste. The best. And if it's not the best, I will give you 10,000 pounds cash or $10,000. Oops, I'm banging that. I will give you a new desk that doesn't squeak. I know I'll give it to you now. If you tell me you don't enjoy this, it's the best tasting thing in the world. It's yours for free and you can eat it right now. And you say, okay. And they say, oh, before you do, before you do that, it's going to give you constipation. And you're going to be constipated for about two weeks. And eventually when you do manage to do a poo, it's going to damage you. It's going to rip you to bits. Uh, and it's going to take, you'll still feel the after effects after a year. Sounds like someone was constipated last year. Could it have been me? Maybe. Would you still take it? Would you start, yeah, I'll have that ice cream on that dessert. Or would you say, no, I don't want to be constipated. What if they said, well, you'll be, you, you'll be fine, but, uh, you will be constipated in five years time. And it'll be so, it'll be really, really bad, but it's, it's not for five years. Just for the sake of eating an ice cream or just, no, no, you're all right. You know, I, I used to have the, the mentality when I was a kid or when I was in my early twenties, maybe. And I used to think, well, it doesn't matter what happens when I'm in my sixties. I don't care about that. But now I'm 52, <laughs> my attitude seems to have changed somewhat. And if you do, if you're lucky enough to get to 50 or 60 or 70 or 80, that's, you know, there is a lot of luck on your side to accomplish that. So, it kind of makes sense to, but at the same time, with the longevity and the medicine these days, but no one wants to be 90 and be ill. No one wants to be 80 and be ill. 
or 70. They want to be physically fit. Especially if you've got grandchildren, great-grandchildren. You know, you want to be able to enjoy being around them, not be stuck in a chair just looking at them. I think one of the good things about making a, a change in your life, it's not even, it's not even so much, I don't think about, um, the topic so much, even, you know, whether it's smoking or drinking, it's a psychological breakthrough. So if you choose to stop doing something or you choose to continue down a path of recovery or feeling better about yourself things change things have changed your attitude changes Something in your brain changes. And whether it's drugs or it's alcohol, whether it's cigarettes, uh, whether it's uh, gambling even, you know, it could be lots of different things that, because you know, gambling can ruin someone's life quicker than crack. I mean, someone can, their whole life can be ruined in, you know, an hour, 10 minutes even. You know, they could lose everything. So, when you choose to make a difference, when you choose to, to remember that every second of every day you choose what you do next, when you choose to remember that, and no one's forcing you, to do anything of course if you it, you know someone's like your boss or whatever says do that thing and you say no then there's consequences there's always consequences anyway there's consequences if you do what the boss says or if you don't do what the boss says it's a case of choosing you know if you say no you may lose your job so there, you know, that's, that's one of those things. And then there's the roll on effect from that. But then if your boss is telling you to do something that is immoral or it goes against your moral, uh, compass, then that, that's a uh, potentially a different thing. So this, let me bore your addiction away. I think that's what I'm going to call it. I'm not going to focus maybe just on cigarettes. Because smoking is an addiction. It is. Anyone that says it isn't is just lying. Some people can smoke. Some people can smoke and every now and then have a cigarette. Most people can't, and I'm sticking to that. Now, I may be wrong, but I've been around, and I've not really known many people that can take... I've known a few that, you know, aren't so bothered, but I've known more that really, you know, smoking is... There, you know, it's, it's important. And it's a different type of addiction, you know, it's, uh, I don't think anyone has ever broken into someone's house because they needed money for cigarettes. So it's a different kind of thing. It doesn't send the person, um, it doesn't, unlike crack or heroin and 
even um, to any drugs really these days, it doesn't cause the person's brain to be delusional. Smoking is almost one of those things that doesn't seem to really affect the brain other, other than the, the need to do it and the connections with smoking and doing different things. But I think it might be good to let that addictions go. Let me bore your addictions away. I don't know. Maybe I'll just keep it as smoking. <laughs> Who knows? I won't decide until I've been to the toilet. So thank you for listening. And as I said before, this is one of those weird kind of recordings where it's not necessarily weird, but you choose and you notice and you focus and you realize how you're feeling. And that question, do you feel better now than you did before you decided to listen to me? Do you feel more optimistic, more positive to stop smoking or to continue down that road of a healthy lifestyle? So remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy. Be gentle with yourself. Lots of love. Bye.